Well, it's good songs. I enjoyed that. Think about it. Your king is known by his mercy. You, you thought about other kings in, the, in history. A king would be known for a lot of things, but you think that your king is known by his mercy and his grace and his love and his sacrifice for you. Uh, you know, most kings would say, you have a sacrifice for me, but to serve a king that says, I want to sacrifice for you is completely different as a different way of thinking altogether. It makes you think of that verse in 2 Corinthians 8. It says, though he were rich, yet he became poor that we might be rich in him. And uh, you just think about all that he gave up to come here so that you could gain all of that. And uh, that's a pretty big blessing. Luke chapter number 13, your Bibles. And um, hopefully this will uh, all come out. I think it uh, ended up getting squished together. I've been trying to work on these uh, quite a bit for a while now to try to get something that would help us. Uh, I worked on it all day yesterday and some of it today. Uh, some people are just, they're, they're visual learners and they, they get it with some, something visual instead of something um, just in words. And so I'm hoping this will help you uh, tonight. Like I said this morning, I, if it was up to me, I would have gone to everybody's house and put them in their car and drove them here today and made them sit and look at this because I think it's that important. If it comes out correctly, um, it'll be something that's really, really very helpful uh, to each of you sitting here because I think it's going to hit everybody at some point of where you're at in your life. In Luke chapter 13, let's start reading in verse number 1. It says this, there, was, there were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans, because they suffer such things. I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Or those eighteen upon whom the tower of Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwell in Jerusalem? I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. And he talks about, in this first little five verses there, he talks about you know, time being kind of short and things coming out of the blue to end a life and, uh, and saying that, look, you need to get your life right and uh, God isn't just, isn't just things happening on the bad, it's happening on the bad and the good, and, uh, and all people are dying, and you need to make a decision to uh, do something with your life before it's too late. And then he goes into, right into talking about having something fruitful for your life and having something to show for your life. In verse number 6, he spake also this parable, A certain man had a fig tree, planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon, and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and find none. He says this, Cut it down. Why cumber it the ground? Why are you letting it take up space when it's not doing anything? And he answering, this is the dresser, answers back to the certain man. The, he answered and said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well. And if not, then after that, thou shalt cut it down. And I want to talk to you a little bit tonight about this idea of the root of our fruit. The root of our fruit. And, uh, and kind of give you a thought. Now, that, looking at this, you see the urgency of, of getting your life in order with God and, uh, and things can come out of the blue. And, and so you need to get your life in order with God. And then you need to start doing something that brings forth fruit in your life. And when you look at this, in verse number 6, you see there's a certain man that's expecting or seeking after fruit um, from his vineyard. The trees are in his vineyard. And let me say something to you uh, that you need to get a hold of tonight is God expects us to have fruit in our life. God wants there to be fruit. God is looking for fruit in our life. There's a side of God that, uh, that is expecting us to have some type of fruit in our life. I was uh, at this conference this last week and the guy was talking about God doesn't really, God desires things from us, but God doesn't expect anything from us. And I, I, I thought to myself, yeah, I disagree with that. I think there are some things that are our reasonable service. So if it's my reasonable service, there should be an expectation that I have this in my life. And one of those things is God expects for there to be fruit in our life, something coming forth from our life. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 15 says this, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening, uh, ravening wolves. Uh, it says this, Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? 
Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. So God is putting some emphasis on the fact that there should be something good coming out of a life that is rooted into the things of God. Now I want you to hold your place there, and I want you to go to Isaiah chapter number 5. Let's go back with me to Isaiah chapter 5, and I want you to see this um, a little bit uh, again. I want you to see that God is concerned about the fruit of His vineyard. God's concerned about the fruit of His vineyard. Isaiah chapter number 5, and I want you to look at it. Isaiah 5 and verse number 1. Now, it says this, Now, now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my well-beloved, touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard and a very fruitful hill. Now, I, the way I drew this up is I, I drew it kind of on the side of a hill, and I, I drew it's fruitful, it's bringing forth a tree, it's got a, it's got a, a fence around it to kind of uh, shield it from things, and, and that's what he talks about. He says, as I planted a vineyard, the, the, the God has planted a vineyard, and he's put it on a fruitful hill, he's put it in the proper place. And then in verse number 2, he says, I, He fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof. You know what he did? He, he gathered all the hindrances that could hinder the ground from being fruitful. He got all of that out, and then he put a fence around it. And then the latter part of that, in the middle of that chapter, that same verse, he said, I built a tower in the midst of it, meaning he set up something so he can keep watch to make sure that nothing's getting in to cause problems with his, uh, with his vineyard. So he fenced it. He gathered up the stones. He said he planted it with the choicest vines. He put the very best that you can put into it. He put that in this choice place. I built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth, watch, wild grapes. What did he do? He, in, the, in the Luke 13 passage, we've got a tree that's bringing forth no fruit. In Isaiah chapter 5, you have him planting a vineyard in there, and it's, it's bringing forth something different than what he planted. And when I, I look at this, I outlined it a little bit. I said this, the, the, the placement of the, of the tree, put it in, the, in a fruitful place. The protection of the tree, put a tower to watch out and a fence around it. The planting of the tree took out anything that would hinder it and put choice vines in its place. The plan for the tree, he put a wine press right there so that it could be useful. As soon as it brought forth its grapes, he can immediately do something with that. The problem, though, with the vineyard was this. It brought forth something completely different than what he intended for it to have. God's interested in the right kind of fruit coming out. Now, he's not just giving this illustration. In this, when he's illustrating this, he's talking about people. In fact, in verse number 3, he says, And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, between me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard than have th that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. He says, And now, go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. He expects the right fruit in his vineyard. He says this, I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the walls thereof, and it shall be trodden down. And I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain, that they yeah, rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts, watch, is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment. But behold, oppression for righteousness, but behold, a cry. And he says, he said, my vineyard is the nation of Israel, and the plants are the individuals there of it. And when you look back at this story in Luke chapter 13, a person could say very clearly, could say, well, he's talking about Israel, the vineyard, but he's also talking about the individual trees of it. And I think there's not a far stretch to say that God is concerned with the people, His people, bringing forth fruit in their life. And so you see in verse number 6 a certain man, and I think that could represent God very easily, that God's expecting some kind of fruit from us. But when you look a little bit further, you see also, when you look at the tree, you see a tree. And that tree is supposed to bring forth fruit, and that's 
what I would consider people. And I would, if, if you do that, go to the next slide that we've got. And I want you to see something that I think may be helpful. When you look at Colossians chapter number 2, I've got it written up there, Colossians 2, 6 and 7. It says very plainly, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him, rooted and built up in Him, established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Even in the New Testament, what God is intending for His people, the church, and individuals within it to do, not only the church to be fruitful, but individual people to be fruitful within the church. And what he's encouraging to do is he says, look, I want you to be rooted in the things of God. But listen, your root will determine what the fruit is. I want you to be rooted in Him. I want you to be rooted in Christ. And then I want you to be built up in Christ. And then I want you to be established in the faith. Meaning you have to go through some things and and maybe be stronger in the faith. And if you'll be rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith, then you're going to abound with thanksgiving. You have fruitfulness in your life. Here's the idea. There's no fruit when there's no root. And if the root is bad, listen now, the fruit will be bad. I read it to you this morning, but in John chapter 15 and verse number 1, I read it to you and it said this, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth no fruit, he taketh it away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it. So he's, he's interested in cleaning it up to bring forth, it says, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. Now folks, listen. You cannot bear any fruit unless you've got the right root. That he can't bear it of himself except that abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. Now folks, listen. You're not going to have any fruitfulness in your life outside of you being rooted in to Jesus Christ. He says this, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For for without me you can do what? Nothing. Nothing. The idea is, if you don't have the right root, you will not have the right fruit. I want you to do the next slide. I want you to see something. I want you to look at Galatians chapter number 5 with me. Galatians chapter number 5, and you put that next slide up there. You can look at this. And I want you to see it. God's expecting some fruit. And it's, it is, we are supposed to be rooted in the right things so we bring forth the right fruit in our life. When you look at Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 16, this I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We talked about the fact that this morning that the Word of God and the Spirit of God working in us should, verse number 22, bring forth fruit in our life, the fruit of the Spirit. Now, folks, we should be seeing the fruit of the Spirit in the life of Christians. I mean, how many say amen to that? You should have, you should have fruit in your life, right? Amen. A Christian should have fruit. We should be seeing love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. You should be able to see the fruit of God working in our life. But you're not going to see the fruit unless you're not in the right root. Now, go to the next slide. I want you to see the the next one. What he says in Galatians chapter number 5 as well, in verse number 19, now the works of the flesh, meaning the fruit of the flesh. The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. And I have all of them up there. Adultery, and fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, sedition, heresies, envying, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and to sum it all up, and he says, and such like. Now these are the things that come out of a life that's not rooted in the things of Christ. You have the wrong things come down, the, the fruit of the flesh. Now what I wrote down at the bottom, if you go back up one more slide, I want you to just look at this and get a visual aid with this. What every bit of this depends on is what I have written just above that blue line. Things that have been put in us and ways we respond to it. And you know what each one of us have an opportunity to have put in us? You have the Holy Spirit. If you're saved today, you have the Holy Spirit in you. You have a Bible. You have preaching. You have teaching. You have good counsel. You have time, people taking time with you. Listen, you have mercy and grace. They sang about that a few minutes ago. You have love and you have God correcting us in our life. All the things you need for you to have everything you want to bring forth fruit, it's all been put there. But the problem is, how do you respond to it? 
Look, if you respond to the Holy Spirit by yielding yourself to the Holy Spirit, then you can bring forth fruit. If you respond to the Bible by abiding and meditating it, then you can bring forth fruit. If you respond to preaching by submitting to it and the teaching by applying it, then you can bring forth fruit. If these things are being put into you like counsel and time and you respond to it with heeding the counsel and patience and the mercy respond with thanks, with being thankful and the grace with receiving the grace of God and the love with accepting it and the correction with enduring it, then guess what? You can have fruit in your life. Flip to the next slide, though. Here's the problem. When you've got the Holy Spirit and the Bible and preaching and teaching and counsel and time and mercy and grace and love and correction, and you respond to it by grieving the Holy Spirit or resisting the Holy Spirit, you respond to the Bible by replacing it with something else. I'd rather hear stories than I would hear the Bible. You respond to preaching by refusing it. Or, like I said this morning, you're spending your time looking at other things than you are listening to the things of God. God's trying to give you everything you need for you to have a fruitful life. The problem is sometimes we can't even disconnect. Like my phone's sitting over there. We can't even disconnect from our phone for one hour for God to put the right things into our life so that we can have fruitfulness in our life. When we respond to preaching by refusing it and rejecting teaching, and we're impatient with the counsel and with the time, and we're unthankful and we're misusing the mercy and the grace of God, and I couldn't even think of a word with love, just rejecting it, I guess, is what you would say, and despising the correction of God, you know what you do? You do not bring forth any good fruit in your life. What you begin to bring forth is wild grapes. Witchcraft, hatred, variance, sedition, envy. And let me tell you something. Here's the the message for tonight. We... I, we deal with so much of this in churches, and it shouldn't be the case. You see, why are people, listen, a little, little, little close to this, why are people not here today that used to be sitting in this, in this room that are now involved in adultery and fornication? And some people, I just found out this week, some people that used to sit right here are involved in absolute gross wickedness. How does a person that sits, listen, sits in the same church with some of you, where they got the same Holy Spirit, same Bible, same preaching, same teaching, same counsel, same time, same mercy, same grace, same love, same correction. How do they end up in hatred? How do they end up in adultery, divorce from their spouse? How do they end up in fornication and uncleanness and lasciviousness? How do they end up in idolatry? How do they end up in Satanism? How do they end up in these things? The very same things you've got put into your life, they've got put into their life, but they're bringing forth some really bad fruit. It's because they're not responding to it. Everything else in life is more important than the things of God. They're not responding, and I promise you, if you don't respond to the things of God, then it doesn't matter what we try to put into the root system, the root system is going to be bad, and it's going to bring forth bad fruit. Go to the next slide for me, if you would. I saw this when we were at this this meeting this last week, and I, I thought this is so crucial to people. This is, this is true. We see this all the time. In fact, I called, somebody called me on the phone today to ask me a question, and we talked for an hour or so, and this is some of the stuff we talked about on the phone today. Just dealing with people. And this was a pastor of another church asking, how would you deal with somebody that's having these issues? And I said, oh, as a matter of fact, I'm about to do this. I'll send it to you when I get through doing, finishing it up. But you know what? When you see the fruit in lives of iniquity and foolishness and immorality and shame and transgression and divorce. And, you know, where does divorce come from? It comes from the hardening of our hearts. We start seeing besetting sins and addictions and all the things that are happening. Why is it there? Somebody says, well, let's attack the fruit. We've got uh, adultery. Let's attack the adultery. We've got uh, uh, iniquity. Let's attack iniquity. We've got addictions. Let's attack the addictions. It's not a matter of attacking the fruit. It's about figuring out what's going on in the root. It's about where does this stuff coming from? Remember now, I told somebody today they were talking about, I need need the fruit of the Spirit in my life as a young person. I need the fruit of the Spirit in my life. I need more love. I need more joy. I need more peace. Can you teach me how to to maximize the love and the joy and the peace in my life? Yeah, it's real simple. Here's what it is. Don't focus on love, joy, and peace. You know what you focus on? Walking in the Spirit. Because if you've got the right fruit of walking in the Spirit, 
The Spirit brings forth the fruit. I don't have to concentrate on the fruit. I've got to concentrate on my rooting in the, in the Spirit, and then that will just spring up out of me. Love, joy, and peace is a product of me walking in the Spirit. I don't have to try to... That's the problem we're having is that most people are trying to paste plastic flute, fruit onto the tree. It's not a matter of that. It's a matter of you being rooted in the right things, and the fruit will take care of itself. Now, folks, listen, if you're rooted in the wrong things, the fruit will take care of itself. You'll see all those things. Now, this is what I thought was really good. There are people sitting in this room today, and, and, and it's not a matter. The reason why you're having some of these things in your life, I don't think, in my person, personally, I don't think it's because you're bad people just trying to reject the preaching, reject the spirit, reject all the stuff of God. I don't think that's the case for everybody. For some people, I think it's, it's more of this. Things have happened to them and the ways they've responded to it. For some people that I end up counseling or talking to, it's things that have happened to them and the way they're responding. So it may be that they, they, they may be a child of God that have gone through some things with abuse or, or rejection or they felt betrayed by somebody in their past or abandonment. We talked about all these this week. Or it may be a conflict or it may be neglect or it may be a death or a disappointment in their life. Or it may be a divorce or it may be a disease. And, and when you, let's just zoom in on one of them. Let's say divorce. It may be somebody coming from a home where mom and dad was divorced. And you know what they, the, the, the ways they responded with that is with all those things, isolation. Maybe insecurity. You know there's a lot of people that are divorced. They come from divorced homes and they feel very insecure about things. Why? Because there was a day that mom and dad were both together. And then one day they were together. And the next day, all I knew was dad lived in a different location than mom. And I was having to split my time and everything was ripped apart. My world was ripped apart. You know what they feel very much after that point? They feel a little bit insecure about things. They have a little bit of fear. Somebody that's been abused in their life, they may feel very isolated. You can't figure out in church why that person doesn't talk a lot, why that person doesn't do a lot, why that person seems very isolated, and it may be because of the things they've gone through in their life. They respond with fear. They respond with depression. They respond with anger. They respond with bitterness. There's a lot of people that have bitterness in their life. They respond with resentment. They respond with guilt. They respond with shame. They respond with suicide. And the root is what's bringing forth the fruit. The things that happen in their life and the way they've responded to it, there's something deep down in there that is a problem and it's bringing forth issues in their life. And I'm going to tell you, if you've been doing this any amount of time with any amount of people, you will find there's a lot of people just like this in churches. It's not necessarily because they want to be a rebellious, bad person. It's because there's so many things happen in their life. They're actually confused about what to even do in life. Who is God? How do I trust God? Where was God at when this happened in my life? There's a lot of tangled knots in people's lives that we're trying to fix in their life. And it's not that we're trying to fix, when you're trying to fix an addiction, it's not trying to attack the addiction or attack the immorality, although we do have to discuss that. But a lot of times it's trying to figure out where does this come from? And it comes from a root. So look back at Luke chapter number 13 with me. And I want you to see something extremely good about our God. Luke chapter number 13. There's fruit, bad fruit, no fruit coming out of people's lives. And God expects there to be good fruit. I want you to see what I think is just another aspect of the same God. A certain man demands fruit. And he says to the dresser, "Let's let's just get it out of here. Why let it hinder the ground or cumber the ground anymore? I want you to zoom in on verse number eight. I want you to see something good about our God. It's something when I pray, a lot of times I end up praying about this a lot of times. And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I have digged about it and dunged it. I want you to look at the dresser for a little bit, and I want you to think about the fact that we serve a good God that is long-suffering. And I think it's a side of God. I think when you look at this, you can see the long-suffering of God, the patience of God. I think you see the Spirit of God in this. I, see, I think you see in the dresser's response, you see a side of God where he says, there's a side of God that says there has to be fruit. 
But there's a side of God that says, we'll give it a little more time to bear that fruit. But I want you to see what he does when this is the case. And I want you to get it. He said, let's let it alone for a year, and then let's do this. Let's dig about it, and let's dung it. And if it bear fruit well, and if not, then after that, thou shalt cut it down. So let me say something to you about what God might do as the dresser of your life to help you bring forth some, the right fruit in your life. That's what he might do. He might dig it. You say, what do you mean dig it? Well, what's what he said. The root is the problem with the fruit. And so what God may have to do, and what we may have to do, is dig up some of the things in your life and get those things out of your life. I think it's interesting when he said in John that, that uh, he talked about fruit, he talked about purging the fruit. Now, he didn't say pruning the fruit, he said purging the fruit. I asked Stacy to look this up, and I was trying to look it up, the difference between pruning and purging. Pruning, you might sculpt the tree and trim the little edges off so it looks prettier and all that stuff. But when you purge something, you're actually taking some things out of it and off of it that hinder it from doing its growth. I think there's some things in our lives, and they're deep down, listen real close, they're deep down in our lives that God wants to remove out of our lives so that we will bring forth some fruit. And we have to let him do it. Let me make statements to you about this. I never, somebody said this one time, and I thought this is the wildest thing I've ever heard. They said sometimes when a tree will not bring forth fruit, what a farmer would do is beat the tree with a two by four. I thought, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. There's no way. Anybody a farmer or or planted stuff and know what I'm talking about, ever seen this before? Good. And you know what's great about when you do that and nobody does? You can make up whatever you want to, and everybody's like, all right, sounds good to me. But I looked this up to see if that was just a good preacher preaching illustration or if, or if that was for real. That's for real. What they will do to a tree to get it to bring forth fruit sometimes, they said that farmers will even do this, will take a shotgun, a bird shot, and shoot the base of a tree, and it will shock it into the system of bringing forth fruit. They said that one of the things they'll do is they'll begin to dig around the roots of a tree Because what you're doing is you're actually separating it and shocking it and separating some of the bad things out of it to make it grow some new growth so that it will begin to grow the way it's supposed to grow. And when I thought about that, I thought, well, the Lord Lord understood that completely. And that's exactly what God will do in our lives. There are some things in our life, listen to me real close, there are some things in your life that you're having some bad fruit in your life It's because some of the things that have been done in the roots of your life. And you need to allow God to have the opportunity, because He wants to do it, to help you bring forth some fruit by digging up some of the junk and some of the garbage and getting it out of your life. What that means is some of you are going to have to start dealing with some of the stuff in your life. Not just leaving it buried, because I promise you, if it stays in there, the fruit's going to come up but doing something about it, getting, getting alone with somebody that can help you and talking to God about it or talking to somebody about it and getting those things dug up so that you can put the right things in its place. Nobody loves the digging and the dunging. When I think about the digging, I think, you know, you've got to be cutting away some of the roots that are in there, making some space for it, and then the dunging is putting some things in your life that when you think about it, somebody says, I'm trying to help you, what am I going to do? I'm going to put some stinking stuff into your life because it's going to make you better. That doesn't even sound right, but what he's really saying is there is we're going to put some fertilizer, we're going to dig up some of the bad, get some of the bad out, and we're going to put fertilizer, some good things in its place so you can start bringing forth fruit in your life. And let me just say to you, I think God sometimes will do that in your lives and you don't even recognize that He's doing it. You know, in James chapter 1 and verse number 2, He says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall in diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but patience, but let patience have a perfect work that ye may be perfect and entire wanting nothing, meaning you're fruitful at the end of going through something with God. I gave you this the other day, but Romans chapter number 5, verse number 3, and it says, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. 
I wrote this down in my notes, some of the greatest lessons I've learned in my life about things that I've got to fix in my life and how to have fruitfulness in my life have come through difficulties. They've come through God revealing that I've got a problem. And sometimes, listen now, sometimes you don't even know that you've got issues in your life until God starts digging around in your life. And you're thinking, I don't don't like it, it doesn't feel good. Right now, some of you may be saying, I'm going through some things right now and God's trying to, he's, He's making me feel a little uneasy. It feels like He's shaking the roots around in my life a little bit and this doesn't feel good and I understand it doesn't feel good, but maybe He's doing some things in your life to get you to a place to bring forth more fruit in your life. And maybe there's some things coming out. You say, it just doesn't feel real good. And right now, it stinks. But maybe God's doing something right now to make you more fruitful for your future. The certain man that owns this vineyard and owns that tree, he wants more fruit in your life. And maybe you're not producing it. Maybe you're producing the wrong kind. And maybe God's shaking you up a little bit. Maybe God's digging around. And maybe you're saying a little bit. Maybe you come to the altar during a song. Or maybe you come to the altar afterwards. Or in the closet of your house, you're crying out. And you're saying, God, this doesn't feel very good. But maybe God right now is trying to show you where you've got some wrong entanglements and some wrong rooting. And He's trying to root some of that stuff up and purge some things out of your life to get you to a place that you're more useful for Him in the future. I I, I promise you, I have never liked that. I've never enjoyed going through the purging process. How many in here have said, oh, I've loved it. It's been great. The purging's been wonderful. I've never liked going through the purging process. I've never liked it when he said, hey, bring another scoop of dung into his life. He needs a little more of it. Nobody ever likes that. But it's all there. Listen, now we've got a good dresser a good God in our life that is not giving us something that we don't need. He's giving us things that we do need. Listen, if you're having things come out in the fruit of your life and you're wondering, how do I fix some of the issues of my life? I've got the fornication and the adultery and the uncleanness and the different things and the hatred and the, and the wrath and the things in my life that shouldn't be there. And I see them and I don't know how to deal with it. Maybe I need to uh, take this pill or maybe I need to do this thing or go on this vacation. No, you need to let God start digging around in the roots of your life. I want you to look at one last place. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. And I think this is interesting that he said this. He told him, he said, give it a year. Give it some time. I promise you, if these things have been in your roots for any amount of time and you've been growing with bad root system, it's going to take some time to dig those roots up and put some new stuff in. But 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and look at verse number 3. Watch what it says. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the, watch this, pulling down of strongholds. Strongholds. Do you know what strongholds are? They're places that you go, I've preached this before, places you go and you get behind. You know what a stronghold is? It's a wall that's been built. You put a, a brick and another brick and another brick and another brick and you build the base of the wall. Then you maybe offset them a little bit so you can get some strength and you build another brick and another brick and another brick. And pretty soon you have all these bricks built up of this wall. You know what people do? They go and they get behind that wall. That's their safety spot is behind that wall. It's a stronghold. And some of you have gotten behind the stronghold of some false things in your life. And each brick is a different thing. Maybe each brick is an abuse and a rejection and a divorce and a problem and a this and a that in your life, and you've stacked them up. Some of you are thinking, I don't, none of this makes any sense to me, but some of you are going, this is exactly what's going on with me. And you've built up a huge wall of all these things, and what you do is you get behind them, and you're never doing anything for God because you're hiding behind the walls of all your issues in life. And when he's talking in this, mainly he's talking about false doctrines that they've built their lives around, but it's, it, it's for anything. It's things you've got in your life that you've built up that have got to be pulled down so that you can have the right things put in your life. Verse number five, that same place. Watch this. You've got to pull some things down. In verse number five, casting down what? Say it again. Casting down what? You know what it is? The things that have gone into this mind over time. 
You know what some of you, you know what you've got in your mind? Some of you have got some bad stuff in your mind, but some of you have got some bad ways of thinking about God, some bad things about thinking about people, some bad things of thinking about your family, some bad things you're thinking about, all kinds of stuff in your life. You think that everybody's out to abuse you. You think there's no happy family. You think that you have all these things that are rooted and built up in your life. And those things have got to be torn down and the right things have to be built up. Casting down imaginations. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, watch this, and bringing into captivity, watch, every what? It's right up here, folks. Every thought to the obedience of Christ. And having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. You know what he's saying? You need to tear down some of the bad stuff you've got in your life and start building up the right things in your life. And this takes time. And there's enough people that we deal with on a regular basis that this, this tree is their life. And folks, let me tell you what I want your tree to be and what God wants your tree to be. He wants you to bring forth Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. That's what He wants in your life. But you're only going to have that if you're rooted in the right things. And some of you, even right now, maybe you're young, maybe you're older, I don't, it doesn't matter. But some of you are not responding to the good things God's trying to put in your life, and you're not going to have any of the good fruit in your life. In fact, for some of you, it's going to take till you really start tripping up and things start getting really bad before you ever wake up and realize, I've got my roots in the wrong place. But for some, you've got a lot of baggage in your past. The roots are, are pretty tough, pretty bad. I, I know a lot of your stories. I know a lot of the... And this is something that, that you people got to realize. There's people that see fruit in people's lives and think, well, they're just rotten people. Let me tell you something. They're not all just rotten people. Some of them, if you knew the backstory to some of these people's lives, you would weep over what's happened to them. You'd weep over the roots of their life. You would weep over the childhood they had and the things they went through and the scars they've got in their life. And, and there's no wonder why they, they don't view God the right way and they don't view the Bible the right way. I, I, and I'm writing that book. I was, I was writing about a, a chapter called Hurting People Hurt People. And when you got, I think about this with some people that come into this church, I, I, I liken it to trying to help a, a dog that's been kicked around, it's been kicked out of its house, and, and people kick it and beat it and, and throw stuff at it, and it's scared to death, and it comes into this place, and all you really want to do is you want to feed it and clean it up and, and help it to have a productive life, and you walk up to, to maybe pet it and maybe give it some kind of food, and it bites you, and all you see as a church is people come in that are growling and they want to bite, and you don't realize all the kicking and all the things they've gone through in all their life. No wonder they bite, and no wonder they growl, and no wonder they don't act like everybody else has. It's because of the garbage that's in their life up to this point. And it takes time to deal with those people, to untie the knots, to, to tear down the walls, to dig up the roots, and to put the right things into their life. And it's going to take time with people that come in here, and it's going to take time with some of you as well. Let me say a couple of things. This, don't give up on yourself before you start bringing forth the fruit that God wants to bring forth in your life. Don't get mad at God as God is trying to bring forth fruit in your life. Let me make a last statement is this. Don't be impatient with the trees that are planted in the vineyard around you that aren't bringing forth enough fruit in the speed that you think they should be bringing it in. Because some of them have some roots that God's digging in. And you ought, you ought to be thankful that we're in a vineyard that has a dresser that cares enough to take some time with them to get them to bring forth the right fruit. He expects fruit, but some of you, some of us, we have issues with it, so he has to dig it, he has to dung it, he has to purge it, so that we can bring forth the right fruit. Let's stand to our feet. And I want you to just think about this tonight, maybe just a thought, just to help you think through a few things, maybe in your own life, or maybe in the lives of somebody around you, as you're dealing with them, to help you think a little deeper than what you may have thought about the fruit in people's lives. Lord, we love you. We ask you to bless tonight. I pray that you'd help 
and touch each life in the way that you need to touch it tonight. I've tried to just be faithful with illustrating your word. Now, Father, I pray that you would please bear witness with that in the hearts of people. Now, Father, I pray if there's people here that are not responding right to the good things you're putting in, that today would be the day that they would start to get those things correct. And those people, Father, today that have roots in all kinds of bad things, I pray that today would be the day they yield themselves to you, digging and dunging and purging so that they can have fruitful lives for the future. Lord, do the work now that only you can do in Jesus' name. Amen. She's going to play. Why don't you pray tonight? This